Welcome back, everybody. We are up to topic 2.5 of the APUSH curriculum, and it's titled Interactions Between American Indians and Europeans. So let's get started. So our guiding question for our topic today is how and why did interactions between Europeans and Native Americans change over time? So how and why did they change over time? Well, let's look at cooperation first, and then we'll look at conflict second. So on the cooperation side, um, this is pretty self-explanatory. The Native Americans uh, were seen as a, a potential, um, you know, a buyer for French and Dutch and British and Spanish uh, weapons. And they were also seen as potential allies in conflict. So the Europeans would sell and arm uh, weapons, arm rather, the Indians with weapons, as you can see here in the images. We also looked in a previous section about the intermarriage uh, between Europeans and Native Americans. It was far more common with the Spanish, that's where we get Mestizo, and the French, that's where we get Métis, which is basically the same thing. It was not as common with the English settlers. They were not into the intermarriage thing. Now, from the Native American side, um, they weren't just sitting idly by as victims. They saw the Europeans as a source of opportunity as well. Uh, from the Native American perspective, those, those guns and cannons and horses and everything else that the Europeans have, that could be used against your rivals. So if you had a particular tribe you didn't like, if you were able to ally with them, you're harnessing that power. And so we're going to see this time and time again we have European uh, and Indian alliances rise and fall uh, as we get into conflicts among the Native Americans. All right, so we looked at the cooperation part, and alliances, trade alliances, all that stuff. Now let's get into some conflict. And our first war, first of many Indian wars we're going to look at this year, we're going to refer to as the Powhatan Wars. And the Powhatan Confederacy was this very powerful group of, of uh, Native Americans uh, right around the Jamestown area. And so this would have been the, the original Native Americans that people like John Smith would have had to interact with. Uh, Pocahontas would have been uh, part of this uh, confederacy, for example. As you can imagine, um, with the expansion of Jamestown and other colonies around it, uh, that's going to gobble up a, gobble, <laughs> cobble up a lot of land. And that gobbling of land is going to lead to conflict. In this, in this case, we're talking full-scale war. And by 1646, after a series of conflicts we know as the Powhatan Wars, the Indians had basically been uh, banished from their lands around Jamestown. So what explains the fact that the Powhatan were defeated? How do they go from being you know, the only game in town and then having a tiny little settlement to being overwhelmed by that tiny little settlement? There's... We're going to call these, the, call these the three Ds. So we, in an earlier section, we had the three Gs, God, glory, and, and uh, gold. And this time around, the three Ds are going to be disease, disorganization, and disposability. The disease part, we've been through this. We know what that's, ta that's talking about. The disorganization refers to the fact that um, all Native Americans didn't belong to the same tribe, the same group, and there was not always a lot of unity uh, on message on how to deal with the white settlers. And then finally, disposability. Uh, particularly around Jamestown, uh, the English, have, you know, they were, they eventually didn't see a lot of use for having Native Americans around. They didn't really see the need for them. They, they stood in the way of tobacco plantations and, and that sort of th thing. So they were disposable. So if you put all those together, what you have is a very land-hungry and also very well-armed white settlement, um, and then you have a disease-weakened, disorganized group that weren't seen as very valuable um, to, the, to the Europeans. All right, so that was the Chesapeake area. Now let's go up to New England, uh, specifically up to, say, the modern-day Rhode Island, Connecticut area, and we call this the Pequot War. And like Powhatan, uh, the Powhatan Wars, this is an example of a conflict over land, as pretty much all Indian land, uh, Indian wars were throughout American history. And uh, you can see uh, in this, this engraving, we've got um, English uh, militia here, and they are attacking this Indian village 
and they're being assisted by other Indians, right? We talked about these alliances. So this group and this group didn't like each other, and the English could take advantage of it by enlisting them in that fight. Uh, this is a, a war that uh, does not go well for the Native Americans. Uh, the Pequot tribe is nearly uh, wiped out by this war, and for about 40 years, things settled into an uneasy peace. And that brings us to uh, King Philip's War. Now, you're thinking, who is King Philip? I don't remember that English king. Well, he wasn't English. He was actually a Native American known as Medicom. The English called him King Philip. And King Philip or Medicom decided that the only way that the English could be defeated, could be defeated, is if um, all the Native Americans kind of formed this one big alliance of tribes in New England to, to wipe out the white settlements before it was too late. And so in 1675, the war begins. It begins with a, a coordinated series of attacks all across these frontier settlements. Uh, the Native Americans just um, really uh, caught the English pretty, pretty much by surprise, uh, particularly these vulnerable out, you know, outlying settlements. They were easily attacked by the Native Americans, got very, very bloody. By 1670, uh, 1676, the war was over, and the war ended in a failure for the Native Americans. As, again, we've seen this with pretty much all the Native American wars. They were simply outgunned and could not win. Medicom, or King Philip, um, lost his life. He was captured and beheaded. His, his wife and son were sold into slavery. Uh, just a really um, a sour end from the Native American perspective. And this is kind of like the final big Indian war. Um, in New England. Now, during the French and Indian War, there there will be some unrest here and there, but this is kind of the end of the game. All right, one more example of Indian resistance is going to sound really familiar to you because we looked at it in a previous video uh, back in section, uh, excuse me, uh, period one. We call this Pope's Rebellion, Pope's Revolt, also known as the Pueblo Revolt, Pueblo Rebellion. It's got a bunch of different names, kind of confusing. Uh, but in 1680, what happens is uh, the Spanish had really made a lot of enemies out of the Pueblo people in modern-day New Mexico, and the Pueblo decided to rise up, and rise up they did, led by Pope. Now, in the course of this rebellion, uh, hundreds of Spanish settlers are going to be killed, uh, Spanish churches torn down, it's going to take the Spanish uh, some 50 years to reconquer the area, to take over this area, um, and once the Spanish did retake the area, it really kind of forced uh, their hand a little bit. They decide, they realized that, okay, our harsh policy had, had basically blew up in our face and cost uh, a lot of lives and, and what have you. So maybe in the future what we should do is go a little easier on the Native Americans. So it's going to lead to some accommodation. In other words, it's going to uh, lead the Spanish to maybe turn their blind eye a little bit on some Native American religious practices that they didn't like, but they realized they had to tolerate in order to prevent another rebellion. All right, so that is our topic on the how and the why. The interactions between Europeans and Native Americans changed over time. Think back to all those Indian wars, but also remember there was a lot of cooperation as well, whether that was alliances, whether that was trading, whether that was intermarriage, uh, both cooperation and conflict with the Native Americans.